We've been talking about the names of God, and it has been absolutely tremendous. Uh, it has transformed my life, my prayer life. And just knowing who he is, going into a deeper revelation of who he is, experience his character uh, and his nature, and knowing who he is to me and who he is to you. And it's been great. Today we're going to talk about Jehovah Rapha. And we talked about that last week, and we mentioned how he, Jehovah Rapha is a God that heals us. And today we're going to talk about the healing power of love, uh, especially since it's our anniversary. But Jehovah simply means the name I am, and he reveals himself to us. The name Rapha is actually a name that restores people. And so today we're going to talk about restoring people by the love of God. You know, our mission statement is restoring people by the love of God, igniting passion through authentic worship, and revealing God's purpose through the ministry of reconciliation. So it's really all about the love of God. You know, listening to Mike on the tape, and I listened to it a couple times this week, and I put down some of the facts that he said because they were really very powerful. And he said that our vision is to pass the ministry to the next generation. And we've always said, you know, what we've got to do is reach back a generation and love those well that are of a younger generation. He also stated that we're not going to live in an ivory tower. I love that, don't you? And he said, we're not going to smell like sheep. We're not going to smell like sheep. Now, was he saying that you smelled like sheep? <laughs> yes, they, that's right. We're supposed to be involved with each other, right? And so we love getting in with you and doing ministry with you. That's what we're called to do. Love that. He said that we're a love ministry. That is exactly who we are. We are a love ministry ministry and that our story is going to meet your story and change the end of our story you know when people come through the doors and i meet them i really get excited when i meet a new person especially when we become friends with those people because you know what we should make a difference in their lives but not only that they should make a difference in our lives you know we're called to them but you know what people are called to us it goes both ways and, you know, when we say we're a love church, Church 212 is where you are going to be loved well. You come into this place, you are going to be loved well. You know, Mike, when we did ministry together in Coleman, Alabama, we started our first church in 1982. It's a long time ago. And the name of our church was Word of Life Church. Word of Life Church. And after we were there about four years, Mike decided he was going to go on a sabbatical. And he went to the Westminster Abbey, and he stayed there for 30 days. He said, I just need to get away. I want to get with God, and I need God to speak to me. I want to press into him. But while he was there the 30 days, and you know, that was the day there was no cell phones, right? While he was there for 30 days, he said the very last day, he, he was praying and he said, Lord, you have not spoke to me. I have been here 29 days and I have not received a revelation from you. So he said, I'm going running. And he went out, he went into the woods, he went jogging. And as he got deep into the woods, he sat down in the quietness and the presence of the Lord and the Lord spoke to him there. And he began to talk to Mike about the love of God. He began to talk to him about agape love. And Mike's life was actually transformed that day by the revelation the Lord gave him about agape love and what agape love would look like. So when he came home after his 30 days and told me the story, he said to me, love has transformed my life this weekend just by the revelation that I received from the Lord. And he began to reveal to me what that revelation was. And it was about a love that gives. It was about a love that God has. 
a love that gives. And, you know, at that time in my life, you know, I was going through a lot of emotional things in my life. Very jealous girl. Many of you have heard my story. And uh, a lot of emotional ups and downs and struggles. And you know what Mike said to me? He said, I'm going to love the little girl in you until you're healed. Emotionally and in every other way in your life. You know, I came from a, a divorced family and went through a lot. And, you know, those things really, the things we go through as young people puts a real struggle on our life for our future, for our marriages, for our relationships with other people. It makes us who we are today, what we've been through. And so Mike knew that if he could love me well, he could transform my life. Now, he believed in that love, and I did not, <laughs> you know, because when you are a hurting person, first of all, you think that nobody loves you. You think that nobody cares. You don't even love yourself, you know. But yet he, he received this love that he said, you know what, I'm going to transform your life with the love of God. And he put it to the test. And you know what, it didn't happen overnight. It wasn't the first day that he said, I love you, that it worked. There was still a lot more fighting, a lot more frustration, a lot more anger and emotions that hit the fan many times. But you know what he did? He loved very well. He loved very well. He stood up in the midst of adversity, and he would say, what would Jesus do? Now, you know, when we say that with our words, it's like, yeah, what would Jesus do? Yeah, Jesus would love well. Yes, we should have the love of God. But I want to talk about a real revelation of love. What would love do? What would the kind of love that God has, how would that really transform my life and transform my family? And, you know, when we look at 1 Corinthians 13, it really tells us what that kind of love is about. It says that it's not boastful. It's not vanity. It's not glorious in and of yourself. It's not prideful. It does not speak evil of our brothers and sisters, our loved ones. It does not tear people down. But you know what it does? It builds people up. All of us just want someone to believe in us. All of us want people to love us well and to believe in us. So Mike took that scripture and many, many more of those scriptures to the test. I loved it when he said, I'm going to love you, and there's absolutely nothing you can do about it. If we look at 1 John 4 and verse 16, where our text is going to come from today, starting with verse 16, it says, We have known and believed in the love that God has for us. God is love, and he who abides in love abides in God and God in him. Love has been perfected among us in this, that we may have boldness in the day of judgment, because as he is, so are we in this world. There's no fear in love, but perfect love casts out fear, because fear involves torment, and he who fears has not been made perfect in love. We love him because he first loved us. Point number one is this, the Christian's response to God's love. Now, when it said in verse 15, uh, 16, it says, we have known and believed in the love God has for us. Look at those two words, known and believed. Sometimes we know God loves us, right? We all know God loves us. The word tells us that God loves us. We know he sent his only son, Jesus. But you know, a revelation came during the same time when, in, when we were in Birmingham, Alabama, and we were going to the streets of Birmingham and ministering to the people that were living on the streets. We were ministering to the prostitutes and many others. And we came upon this, this girl. She was a prostitute, and she was... She saw us coming, and, and when she saw us coming, she turned and put her face in the corner of a building, and she didn't want to talk to us. And so uh, Mike, Mike went up to her, and he said, did you know that God loves you? And she's got her face in the corner, and she shook her head, and she said, yes, I know God loves me. 
But she wouldn't talk to us. She never turned around and looked at us. And you know, when we walked away, Mike said, you know, she knows God loves her, but she doesn't believe that he loves her. That revelation, <laughs> it really hit me. And you know why it hit me? Because that's who I was. I knew God loved me, but I didn't believe that he loved me. I couldn't believe he loved me. You know, when you felt rejected by your parents through divorce, lived in three different homes growing up after their divorce at the age of 12, you know, you can, you can feel unloved. And you can grow up thinking, nobody cares about me. Nobody loves me. And you become bitter. You become hard. And you can close your heart off. When you need love and you're not getting love, your heart becomes hardened and you close your heart off to other people. And you know what happens when we close our heart off? We close it so that no one else can hurt us. But when we close our heart off, what happens is we can't love others, and we don't let others come into our life either. But not only that, I took it a step uh, further thinking about my husband, Mike. I loved him so much, and I was so jealous of him because I was afraid of actually losing him. You know, my father was a minister, so... Uh, there was a time he and my mom got a divorce. He found someone else. And, you know, and I thought one day Mike will find this cute little girl that will come along and take him away from me. So, you know, I was afraid. And then that, that being afraid, that fear, it turned into torment. I began to be tormented in my mind that I was going to lose him one day. N and no matter how many times he would tell me he loved me and he would assure me, that he was there for me, I could not believe. Fear will put you in a place of not being able to believe. It'll put you in a place of torment. And that's where I was. But so then when I thought, I love God, I know God loves me, but I don't believe he loves me, then I thought, I know Mike Harrison loves me. But I don't believe that he loves me. Those are two very, empower, two very powerful words. We have to know and rest assured the confidence that we have in God and trust him that he cares about you. He cares about your needs. He cares about what you're going through. And sometimes we don't believe that he does because we don't see our circumstances turn around or change quick enough. Or we question why we've gone through what we've gone through. Or why things are not working out. And then that heart of disbelief begins to settle in. And, and you know, when we can't believe, we'll be robbed of everything. How can you have faith if you can't believe? People's response to the love of God, sometimes it's different. Sometimes they doubt. Can God really love me? After all, look what all I've done. Look where I've been. Look how I've acted. Sometimes just today. <laughs> look how I've acted just this weekend. Look how I've acted just this weekend. God, I'm so ashamed. Isn't it something when we step outside of the love of God or we step outside of the word of God that we bring shame upon ourselves? But here's the point about the love of God. When we experience love, we want to share that experience with others. And I'm going to tell you something. Mike Harrison really touched me with the love of God. He showed me, as the man of our house, how to live the love walk. It worked. It transformed my life. And I give him so much credit that the power of God worked through him to me. You know, that's our testimony, but that's what we should be doing as well, is loving people to Christ. Point number two is the perfect or the perfecting of love, both now and for eternity. Listen at this. It says, love has been perfected among us. 
You know what the word perfected means? It simply means mature. When we grow in the word and we grow in Christ and we begin to mature in him, what happens is the love of God becomes perfected in us. So it simply means maturity. It goes on to say that we may have boldness in the day of judgment. You know there's coming a day. It's coming. That the great white judgment throne of God is going to be here. We're going to all be judged. But you know what? Without the love of God being shed abroad in our hearts and full, we might not, we might be a little ashamed to stand before that judgment day. Because I'm going to tell you, when we love, it covers a multitude of sin. Literally. When we love, it transforms a friendship. When we love, it transforms a marriage. When we love, it transforms our children's lives. When we love, it transforms us. And all the things we've learned in the word, when we stand before that great white judgment throne of God, what are we going to feel about ourselves? What are we going to say? How are we going to respond? And you know what? The perfect love of God, the maturing of the word of God, the growing up spiritually, I want to be able to, as he says here, stand bold in the presence of the Lord. That we know he would say to us, well done, man. You've, you've, fought, you've fought a good fight. You've won the race. Point number three is this. The completion of love, it says there's no fear. Perfect love casts out fear. Fear has torment. You ever been tormented in your mind about something? Can we relate that torment to fear in any way? Think about that for a moment. You know, when Mike was going through his physical challenges, I, I may have shared this with you. I believe I did a, a, a few Sundays way back. But when he was going through some physical challenges, you know, I, I was always controlling him. Mike, you don't need to eat that. Mike, you need to do this. Mike, you need to be exercising more. Mike, Mike do this. Mike, do that. And all of a sudden, I realized what was happening is that I was trying to control everything he did, and I didn't know why in the world did it even matter. Because I want things my way. Because I want to fix it. Because I want to fix him. I want it right. So there's a reason behind control. So I sat down and I, I wrote down the word control on a piece of paper. I do this often. When I'm going through something or you know, I'll, I'll try to think through what's going on and I'll get a word and I'll write it down and I'll look at that word and say, okay, God, talk to me about this. So I wrote the word control down. And then I said, what's controlling me? Why am I controlling? Fear. It's fear. What am I afraid of? I'm afraid of losing him. So what am I going to do? I'm going to gather I'm going to control. I'm going to be the one in charge. I'm going to make this happen. It's I, me. How can we release that fear? Sometimes, see, we don't recognize it as fear. How can we release that to the Lord? Perfect love cast out fear. I really came to the revelation of this. It's his life. Stop controlling him. Why do you feel you got to control? It's going to fall apart. They're going to leave you. Somebody's going to quit. What are the reasons? That we allow fear to torment our mind and keep us in bondage, stressing over our everyday life issues. But you know what? <laughs> when we recognize what it is, whether it's fear, whether it's anxiety. You know, I was thinking earlier this morning 
about grief. Because when you lose a loved one, and many of you have, when you lose a loved one, grief is, I've never known grief before like I have known it this year. Never, ever even understood it until this year. And I was just thinking about the word, what it does to you, where it comes from, when does it come, what does it look like, how strong is it? And so I was just thinking through my own questions about grief. Then you know what I thought? When I dealt with fear years ago in my 20s, it was just as tormenting as grief can be. Think about that a moment with me. So when I revisited the fear that was in my life in my early 20s and it being an emotion, I thought, what did that fear do then to me? How did I feel during those times? And I'm going to tell you, it was one of the scariest times of my life. And I think, I was thinking this morning, maybe fear was stronger than grief is today. And the reason I felt that is because back then, I didn't know how to control the emotion. I didn't know how to control what was going on in my life. So it stayed with me longer. Fear stayed with me longer, and I gave into it. It fed me. You know what? Fear became my master. I was its servant. And when fear would say, you can't do this, I, I would say, I can't do that. I began to be bulimic. Is that, is that the word, bulimia? Where I would, would, would go and throw up after every meal in the toilet for two years because I felt like somebody was poisoning me. Now, how stupid is that today? <laughs> you know, you think... How can somebody be poisoning you after every meal? Well, you know what? When you give in to something, it takes hold of you, and it makes you believe it because it's your master, right? So, so I was so tormented and afraid, I literally thought I was going to die. I would wake up in the middle of the night with panic attacks and running. I'd wake up running. I was already running when I woke up. Mike said, I'm going to get a spirit net and put it over the bed and keep you in the bed. <laughs> because I told him, I said, Mike, I feel like my spirit's going to leave my body. When I wake up with that kind of panic attack, it, I would feel this feeling. I can't describe it to you other than to say I felt like I was going to leave and I would jump up out of the bed. The first thing out of my mouth was in the name of Jesus. And I would jump up and say, in the name of Jesus, in the name of Jesus. I would just keep saying it until I felt like I got relief. Because fear had torment. So I was thinking about grief and I thought, okay, I see it now. The Lord showed me this this morning. It doesn't matter what the emotion is that we're going through. It's powerful. If it's anger, if it's resentment, if it's hatred, if it's bitterness, whatever it is, if it's your master, if you've given into it, if you listen to it, if it feeds you, it is a big part of you. Now, of course, I know people would say, now you need to grieve. I agree with you. Take time to get along to yourself and grieve. Oh, trust me, I do. But the Lord spoke to me this morning. There's a difference in grieving and allowing a spirit of grief to get on you. Because you see, a spirit of grief will torment you. But grief, you recognize the emotion and you, you receive it, you deal with it, you handle it. See, the spirit of fear, it, fear is good in that it can tell you, hey, this is going on in your life right now. You better stop controlling. This is getting a hold of you. You need to handle yourself. 
But see, if you don't get a handle of fear, then it turns into a spirit of fear. And then the spirit of fear will torment your mind. So how do you know if it's a good fear or not? Are you being tormented in your mind? And the word of God says, the love of God has been shed abroad in our heart by the Holy Spirit. And you know what? The love isn't an emotion. Just like the others. The others are just negative ones. I've said this many times. Negative emotions are good. They're not bad. Because negative emotions will help you to see some of the ugliest things that's going on in your life. And I was reading in Genesis where the word tells us to become perfect. Perfect our faith. Perfect ourselves in him. Right? So we can't allow that spirit to get off on us. But here's the deal. If we can take in the love of God. And we can learn about agape. That it is a love that gives beyond measure. It's a love that yields to. It's a love that says your will and not mine. It's a love that puts our loved ones first and not ourselves. It's one that wants to serve you. How can we serve? How can we serve one another? How can we love one another? I want to put a charge out to us this morning, our church family. And before I put this charge out, I want to tell you how we're going to love others well, how we're going to reach our community, how we're going to step outside these four walls is to be committed to being, first of all, a love church. We're going to love others. There's not anything they can do about it. Secondly, we're going to be committed to be a soul-winning church. I can tell that you are so excited about that. You're looking at me like, soul-winning? What's that? I'm teasing. I want to lead by example that I want to touch people in our community that I would be open to the Spirit of God to talk to me to share Jesus with others, to lead someone to the Lord. I had the opportunity of leading a couple to the Lord this year before I married them, and it, it's so exciting to reach people for the love of God, and I want us to do that. I want us to pray for the lost. I want us to restore people by the love of God and to ignite passion in others and to reveal God's purpose in others. We're already touching so many people abroad, not only here and what we're doing in the valley, but also abroad with missions and um, in the Philippines and in Thailand as well. And then our weekend services through our start track, through recruiting people, training people, mobilizing people to do the work of the ministry and then appreciating them well. That's what Church 212 is about. So here's our charge to the congregation. In Ephesians chapter 4, verses 1 through 3, it says this, As a prisoner for the Lord, then I urge you to live a life worthy of your calling, the one that you have received, right? Be completely humble and gentle. Be patient, bearing with one another in love. Make every effort to keep the unity of the Spirit through the bond of peace. Isn't that great? That's a great charge, isn't it? That we would make every effort to keep the unity of the Spirit. You know, the Holy Spirit is always present with us. Jehovah Rapha, being a God that loves and heals us. You know what? When we're not walking in love, it's grievous to the Holy Spirit. It grieves him. And I want to do everything I can. I want us to do everything we can to love him well. Amen? I want us to pray, and I know there may be some here today um, that are visitors, and maybe you have never accepted Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior, I want to give you that opportunity. 
to do so. I want you to receive the loving Father that we have received. And I want us to just uh, sit here in the Lord's presence a moment and think about the message that has come forth today. What did God say to you? What specific word did he speak to you? And how can we right now through prayer deal with that? Who do we need to love well in our family? What does that look like for you? And if you need to ask Jesus Christ into your life as your personal Lord and Savior, all you have to do is just ask him to forgive you for your sins. He'll cleanse you from all unhealthy habits. And he will certainly love you well. The last part of the verse today says, we love him because he first loved us. And it just stops right there, because he first loved us. Father, today we ask you to forgive us for all of our sins, Lord. We often fall short of your glory, your presence, and who you are in our lives. We ask you, God, to wash us, make us whole, to cleanse us, God, and to make us clean, and to create a new heart within us, God. We ask you to restore, ignite passion in us, to reveal your purpose to us, God. For our families, it's Thanksgiving weekend. Thanksgiving week, Lord, we give you thanks for sending your son, Jesus, into our lives. In Jesus' name, amen.